I think as uh, people will be aware, the, the term emerging markets is loosely defined and investors can often be referring to different things when we talk about uh, which countries and economies are covered uh, by the term. Uh, however, it's generally defined as countries with a low to middle per capita income that are in a transitional phase between developing and developed status. Of course, this encompasses a very broad terrain of countries from the very small uh, all the way up to the very large, uh, such as China and India. Political scientist Ian Bremer defines an emerging market as a country where politics matters at least as much as economics to the markets. Emerging markets are a common point of diversification in many Australian super fund portfolios and feature regularly in discussions around the investment committee table around uh, whether uh, allocations should be increased uh, relative to developed uh, markets uh, and also in terms of and a greater exposure to emerging markets, uh, which countries and which regions should be favoured. Jeff Bazin, Head of Asia Pacific Equities at Maple Brown Abbott, um, who will be discussing uh, the situation in Asia. Thank you. Well, good morning, and uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. You know, the, the science tells me I have basically 20 seconds with which to capture your attention, and if I'm any good, I could hope to hold it for 20 minutes. Experience tells me it's more like five and ten. Um, so in that vein, I'd like to congratulate the organisers of, of this event, ASI, for ensuring that presentations are kept relatively chart light and simple. You know, um, PPA, PowerPoint abuse, is, is a very uh, serious affliction in our industry and as fund managers we're often guilty of uh, indulging in it. So I'm, I'm very happy to sort of try and keep it as uh, uh, a simple and, uh, and really talk to a couple of key issues. In fact, if there's only two messages I'd hope to, to leave you with today, uh, very simply they would be firstly that the, the size, the scope, uh, the breadth of the opportunity set in Asia as a discrete investment allocation uh, may well be bigger than you, you, might, uh, you might expect. And secondly, <laughs> and rather ironically, the, it's the question you just answered, is that over the longer term, should I be successful in uh, convincing you of the first, is that over the longer term you may want to have a, a bigger allocation to, to Asia going forward. And I should be pleased that you did the poll before my presentation rather than after because your, your responses may have changed. Uh, so in that vein, let me um, run through or paint you a picture of the, the sort of the, the high level attributes that I think are important in in really trying to understand the, um, uh, the, the opportunity within the, the Asia X Japan region. You all know it's 10 years since the, the global financial crisis struck. Uh, it's also 20 years since the Asian financial crisis. And in many respects, the Asian crisis uh, laid the platform for a number of the virtues that we observe across Asia today in terms of its investment appeal. Uh, we've been picking stocks in, in Asia for some 15 years now and we were very much attracted to the, uh, the opportunities that were presented following the Asian crisis with very depressed valuations, incredibly depressed in hindsight, um, almost too good to be true. But nonetheless, uh, as the economies and the markets have grown significantly since then, uh, we still see semblances of, of that opportunity today. Asia's underperformed typically for most periods out to the last seven years. It's performed more strongly over the last year, but over five years remains a laggard. And in that context, uh, it's still somewhat of a, a contrarian investment opportunity. You can see here on the slide some of the, uh, the growth dynamics that occur. Asia's less than 10% of the global MSCI benchmark. Despite that, it accounts for roughly a quarter of, of the world's economic output some 50% of, of global FX reserves, more than half the world's population. And as I'll show you in a moment, next year, uh, by the middle of next year, post the inclusion of China A shares in the, in the broader global uh, benchmark, there'll be more securities listed in Asia with a market value of over $1 billion than there are in Europe and the United States combined. Uh, that, that's right. Some 3,000 companies will be 
uh, on offer for global investors with a market value over a billion dollars. Uh, and that's a, a, a pretty significant um, transition and, and something that I think is not probably well understood by, by many investors because they look at the, at the quite minor representation of Asia in the global benchmark, as, as I noted, around 10%. I mentioned populations. I think the population or the demographic dividend is, is well understood by most people. Obviously, uh, you, you have some very large countries. Um, as I said, more than half the world's population in Asia. If you include Southeast Asia as a block rather than Indonesia per se, there's 650 million people in that, um, uh, in that region alone. Uh, and the uh, and the demographic tailwind I referred to is quite powerful. India is the obvious example of that with some two-thirds of the country's population aged below 30 years of age, they really have to mess it up pretty badly to avoid growing or achieving nominal growth of, you know, in excess of 10 per cent because of that, um, that demographic uh, backdrop. In terms of the, the country, sector uh, and stock evolution, again, you can see pretty significant change over the last two decades. The most significant is obviously the, the emergence uh, of China and within that uh, also North Asia, South Korea, similarly growing significantly, whereas previously Asia was very much dominated by Hong Kong, which has always been quite a well-established capital base, and Southeast Asia. Uh, so it's a, it's a va vastly broader uh, and more diverse uh, opportunity set today than what we've seen historically. Likewise, as I said, at a stock level, things have also evolved pretty significantly. The top five stocks today account for about 21% of the, of the regional benchmark compared to over 30 uh, in that prior period. And the number of companies in the benchmark has grown significantly, as have the types of names that investors now have opportunity to, to own. Uh, and you can see some of the, uh, the brands there at the side of the page. Oh, here we are. This is the, the point I was making earlier around the, the, the size of the opportunity set. Here and now today, MSCI Asia X Japan has roughly 1,500 companies with a market value over a billion, compared to the US at, at just under 2,000 and Asia, sorry, Europe at, uh, at 1,243. Uh, so bigger than Europe today, yet it's still a third of the, the benchmark weight uh, and three quarters the size of, of the United States. Now you don't need your virtual reality headsets to work out when you include a shares, China next year, uh, I'm sorry, um, over here, that number will grow exponentially again. The other point I'd note on, on this slide is the vast difference between stocks listed in the market versus those in the benchmark. Uh, and this benchmark is, is MSCI, the other benchmarks are, are as noted, S&P 500 or the stock 600. And that really goes to the question of, well, why don't I just get exposure to the region via the index? Well, the simple answer is the index really only gives you a fraction of the genuine or the ultimate opportunity set that we as, as active stock pickers uh, can buy and, and own on, on our clients' behalf. So that's the first section, the, the point one. Is Asia bigger and perhaps more significant than, than you may have thought? Uh, and, and I really think this dynamic is only going to grow over time as the economies continue to, to grow and evolve. China comes into the market and, and we continue to see a wide range of, of new listings and IPOs as, uh, as economies across the region uh, continue to develop. So maybe I'll, I'll turn to the second aspect around well, wh why would you want to own it? Well, what's the long-term opportunity? Let's start with valuations. Uh, as, as stock pickers, as value managers, for us, this is where it all starts and ends, frankly. What, what can we, we buy for our clients? What price? What's the, what's the return profile like? And on a valuation basis, Asia continues to, to look pretty attractive. Uh, the markets have performed quite nicely year to date. They're up about 30%. Asia as a whole is up something like 50% from its January 2016 lows. But as, a, as I said at the outset, it's still lagged somewhat over the medium, uh, medium term uh, and therefore uh, valuations remain pretty attractive, both versus their own history and against the, the rest of the world. If you look at the longer term perspective within Asia, uh, this is the price to book of, of Asia. Uh, it's trading today at about one and a half times. One and a half times, oh, 
apologies for that, one and a half times, is quite accommodative versus the long-term history you can see for the region, uh, and certainly a long way away from the sort of the bubble-type territory uh, that we've experienced before, and in fact not meaningfully above the kind of the trough levels that we've seen in what were pretty um, uh, acute periods of distress and weak sentiment for the markets. And today, if you look at the fundamentals, and I'll show you those in a moment, in terms of balance sheet strength, earnings progression, uh, and the, the quality uh, or performance of companies generally, things are today quite sound, uh, and, and certainly in our view, not representative of attaining or, or retaining rather a, a discount relative to both the history uh, and other asset classes. A lot of people view Asia as a risky investment destination. Uh, it's, it's high beta, certainly, um, has high operating leverage, but what it doesn't have is high financial leverage. Balance sheets in Asia are strong and getting stronger. Uh, and this goes back to my opening comments around um, the transformation that's occurred since the Asian financial crisis. Uh, lessons were well learnt by, by companies and governments across the region. Today, you could accuse Asian corporates of being lazy with respect to, to capital management and how their balance sheets and their, their capital uh, structure is, is, is managed. And that's because of the lessons and the pain experienced in that period. Today, you can see the, the debt to equity for the Asia X Japan region uh, is very modest indeed at around 20% almost a third of that of the aggregate world. And in fact, within that, there are scores of companies that we look at, and many that we own, that have net cash balance sheets, so no debt. They have uh, cash on the, on the balance sheet, which gives them tremendous opportunities for either expansion or enhancing shareholder returns. And if I go back a slide, this is really uh, an enduring thematic that I think we'll all hear and, and read a lot more about over the coming years because there are some pretty encouraging signs that Asian corporates are now starting to get it, uh, that, that equity markets or capital markets reward companies who manage capital efficiently and reward shareholders and, and the obvious way to do that is via dividends. The payout ratio, i.e. the amount of money that's distributed from earnings every year to shareholders in the form of dividends is quite modest at, at 34% of earnings compared to over 50% for the world. And we all know in Australia as a high yielding market, that number is much higher, it's about 75%. We think the potential for this to grow in Asia is very significant. And in fact, we've, we've just released a little, a little research paper on that issue, sort of giving some background and context to, to some of the levers that uh, are affording Asian corporates the ability to, to be more generous in, in that regard. So I think that's a, a long-term thematic that um, is almost uniquely attributable to, to Asia because you have strong balance sheets, a starting point of very low payout ratio, high free cash, and although economies are still growing pretty strongly, they're clearly not growing as, as, as quickly as they were. So therefore the need to invest in expansion and to grow plant and, uh, and capacity is less great than it was Previously, and he hence the, uh, the focus on things like dividends has become uh, more apparent. Value works in Asia. This is the, uh, the, the point where I tell you that uh, as value managers, you should, um, you should follow our religion that, that we believe in, that over the long term, having a, a disciplined um, and focused investment style, looking at buying those stocks that offer um, uh, upside to the market by virtue of better valuation support has indeed given you a, a, a handsome return uh, against the, the most expensive quartile in the market in this experiment or this uh, exercise uh, has certainly been the case in Asia as, as has been our experience in, in Australia over many years uh, and what we observe in other markets across the, across the globe. The types of stocks that we like to own in Asia, uh, I, again, I think there's a misconception that you can only buy, you know, pretty crappy cyclical stocks or, or SOE, state-owned enterprise companies that, that perhaps don't have the type of quality uh, or, or attributes that you're used to, to owning uh, in other markets such as Australia. Uh, this is a, a, a cheeky example of a stock that's done quite well for us recently. BMW, obviously a well-known brand to you, 
very highly sought after in China. In fact, BMW is often referred to as Be My Wife. Uh, it's very much seen as a, um, a status symbol for, for a young uh, person to, to own a BMW. Uh, and the fundamentals of this industry uh, are, are quite attractive. Although autos typically are more uh, commodity, cyclical, within the, the, the luxury segment, uh, the growth in markets like China, and it would equally apply to other markets such as India and Indonesia, uh, is very significant. You can see the, the portion of sales in China has grown dramatically since 2008, uh, yet overall luxury cars are still a fraction of, uh, of the total market. And yet within the luxury segment, the big three German uh, marks uh, occupy a fairly cosy sort of oligopoly, so the returns are typically far more attractive. We were buying this very company uh, at the beginning of last year at, at around seven, eight dollars a share. Uh, it had derated significantly as uh, concerns around the growth for China um, had become more prevalent. There was uh, a short-term slowdown in auto demand which fed through to inventories and really created a weak uh, uh, sentiment. But the stock was trading at about eight times earnings. It had compounded return on equity for more than a decade at 15 per cent. And we had a lot of faith in the cachet of the brand and also the, the input that their joint venture partner BMW AG would provide to the, the operating of this company. Uh, and I'd have to say in a far shorter time frame than we'd experienced, or expected rather, the market experienced a, a pretty dramatic pickup such that today the shares are trading at around $22 a share uh, with very little change in, uh, in the long term outlook. BMW introduced some new models which have been well received, sentiment overall has improved, but the underlying uh, structure uh, and, and footprint of the company uh, has been relatively stable, yet the market has obviously gone on a wild, um, uh, a wild ro roller coaster in, in that period. And, and I, I genuinely, we could point to many other examples of, of similar high quality companies that we're able to own at, at very modest multiples, often because of the, the macro noise or, the, uh, or, or the, the vast swings in sentiment that you see applied to emerging markets that perhaps aren't as readily uh, observable in, in other markets such as uh, the Australian market. Uh, I know ASI is particularly, and, and many of you are particularly interested in, in ESG, um, as are we. All, all stocks we select for, for our clients uh, are subject or, or chosen through the lens of, of ESG. And I can tell you in Asia, more often than not, uh, it's it's a function of these factors that rule us out of, of buying a particular company, whether it be the alignment of interest or, or often the misalignment of interest between us as minority shareholders and a state-owned company that may be run for the, the benefit of, of the state, not necessarily shareholders. Um, it, it may be a, a, um, a case of assets being held outside of the, the main listed entity or it may simply be poor governance or unsustainable practices. I, I don't want to sort of paint a, a false picture here that, that everything is, is rosy and perfect in Asia. It, it's far from it. But I can tell you over the last decade and a half that we've been looking at these markets, there have been significant and very tangible areas of improvement. Uh, and I think that's beginning again to be reflected in the multiples that you see applied to, to a range of companies uh, as, a, as a result of, the, um, uh, of those benefits. And I'd be happy to chat about uh, any aspects there later in the um, or in the in the Q and A section. The quality of accounting is often noted as a as a potential risk in Asia, and again, I'd I'd, I'd refute that pretty strongly. Most of Asia follows um, generally accepted accounting principles. GAAP that you see applied elsewhere in the world. Uh, disclosure is typically pretty good, um, and the uh, the quality of financials, namely the strength of balance sheets, as I mentioned earlier, remains um, very strong indeed. So with that, let me, let me conclude. Um, as I said at the outset, you know, there's really only two messages I wanted to leave you with. Firstly, the size and the scope and the potential of Asia uh, is significant and in our view will only become more so. And then secondly, uh, the virtues that we observe there, either through valuations strong financials, potential for growth um, remain quite significant indeed. So ho hopefully I've achieved in sort of um, uh, conveying that message and, and 
obviously very keen to, to take some questions later in the, uh, in the session. So with that, I will give you an extra one minute and 15 seconds on Carlo. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Let me start with a special thanks to um, AIST for the kind invitation to, the, um, to this event. Um, today, I'm going to uh, talk about the, the Pacific Alliance region, a special region within Latin America, um, Colombia, Chile, Peru, and Mexico. Uh, I'm not going to refer to our competitor in the region, Brazil. Um, and uh, I'm here with a couple of uh, colleagues from, from my team, uh, Felipe Trujillo, he's the global head of solutions, and Felipe Asenjo, the global head of equity, and he's also the portfolio manager of uh, an equity fund, a uh, Pacific Alliance fund that we have domiciled here in, in Australia. Uh, it's, almost, it's almost two years of this fund running here in, in Australia. Okay. The best kept secret, Pacific Alliance, the Pacific Alliance region. Uh, a quick, quick survey. How many of you are somehow familiarized with the Pacific Alliance region? No? One, two, three? A few, right? A few. So the secret has been well kept. <laughs> That's good. I'm going to unveil it today. Uh, OK. Um, let me, let me uh, start with, uh, with the most relevant macroeconomic uh, figures. Uh, we have here the GDP, sorry, the GDP growth over the last 15 years or so. Uh, this is PP, PPP adjusted, it's 5.1%. Uh, and as of 2016, the GDP of the Pacific Alliance region, these four countries, is, uh, was $3.1 trillion, representing roughly 43% of the Latin American uh, region. Population, 224 million people. Uh, and the trade, the Pacific Alliance region represents 50% of the Latin American trade. The other 50% comes from uh, Brazil. The market cap of these countries, uh, $800 billion and 776 listed companies. This number is, is almost double than the, the amount of companies listed in the Brazilian Stock Exchange. Uh, and the pension fund, I think this figure is relevant. The pension, so, sorry. The, the AUM managed by local pension funds in the Pacific Alliance region is $420 billion. Just you know, to have a, a geographical uh, location, we have here the four countries that comprise the Pacific Alliance. Uh, here is the US, Canada, Mexico is the first country, then Colombia, Peru, and Chile. These four countries, again, comprise the Pacific Alliance region. All right. Now, um, continuing with the, with the macroeconomic data, I would like to uh, emphasize on, on two figures, GDP growth and GD per capita growth. The GD growth uh, from, 2000, sorry, from 2004 to 2016 uh, is, you can see there, is 3.2% for the Pacific Alliance region, which is not bad. I mean, I think it's a, it's a, it's a very good uh, GDP growth. However, if you take a look at the lower graph, uh, the GDP per capita growth is 2.6%, uh, which is double the, uh, the figure for Australia, uh, Brazil, and much higher than USA's and Japan's uh, GDP per capita growth. And to complement that, we have uh, two uh, relevant figures for net FDI. Uh, the CAGR uh, since 2004 is 4.3%. And the real export growth is 3.3%. Uh, Regarding the economically active population, we have uh, that for the Pacific Alliance region, uh, the number, the figure is uh, 23 million people, uh, is almost double the number for Australia, and evidently is much lower than the economically active population in the US. However, However, you can see that the growth in the Pacific Alliance region 
is 1.8%, much higher than the number that we have for US, which is 0.6%. Uh, OK. Um, the markets. I'm going to start with uh, the private markets. And in this graph, I have um, a snapshot of the infrastructure opportunities as well as the real estate opportunities. In infrastructure, I think it's important to mention that for the next five years, the governments or the, the, the governments of the Pacific Alliance region are expected to invest 300, 310 uh, American billion uh, US dollars. The way they ex expect to fund that is 30% through equity and 70% through debt. And here you can see that the country that is uh, adding the most to this figure of three of 310 is Mexico. What is going What is going on in Mexico is that I think it was like a year or a, or, a, or a year and a half ago, the government, the Mexican government, passed a law to uh, to modify the uh, electric sector, and what they are doing is they are capturing a lot of the international investment in the, in, sorry, in the energy sector, uh, especially oil, both onshore and offshore. That's what's going on in, in Mexico. Colombia is a different story, but these 50, 50, US, 50 billion US dollars that we are expecting for the next five years uh, come, uh, is, is going to be invested mostly in roads. Uh, Colombia is a country with a uh, Tremendous lack in in uh, in, in roads, uh, but the government is, is 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 tackling that issue, and the the proliferation of uh, investment funds to help to finance that has been has been very important in in Colombia. Mm, in Peru, same story. In Peru, the, the government is expecting to have is an ambitious. They have an ambitious plan uh, in infrastructure for the next five years. And Chile, Chile is the I would say it's the most developed country in the Pacific Alliance region. They have invested a lot in infrastructure over the last 10, 15 years. And we are expecting sort of a second wave of infrastructure investment for the next five years. That's what's going on in, in infrastructure. Again, many opportunities, both in equity as, as well as in debt. In real estate, it's, it's the same story. Uh, we have uh, we, are, we have an, an office an office space market of roughly 14.3 million square meters for the region, with Mexico representing 43 percent, uh, Colombia uh, 22, same as same, same as Chile, and Peru 13 percent. It's important to mention here that uh, a market like Mexico is a premature market. In in Mexico, the real estate market. It's a public market, and it's very liquid, very similar to the REITs in the US. Mexico are called Fibras, but again, it's very, very liquid. Um, and you know what is interesting in the region, in the Pacific Alliance region, is that you still can obtain very interesting cap rates. Uh, just to mention some cases, in Colombia, it's, it's easy to find cap rates of, of the order of seven, five, seven, 7.5 7 to 8 uh, percent. Chile is also a mature market, and it's, it's hard to find those those cap rates. But you can find something in the order of six, six and a half percent cap rates in, in in Mexico, which is not. I mean, it's not bad. It's, I, I think the, there are there are very very good opportunities still to be exploited in the real estate uh, um, real. Okay, that's pretty much uh, what's going on in the real assets in the region. Moving to uh, liquid assets, let me let me uh, point this this out. Uh, the correlation between developed markets is is high. That's something that's very well uh, documented in, in the academy. So when you buy an ETF, let's say a developed markets ETF, ETF. Uh, that makes sense. You are buying essentially you know the same kind of of risk, they move like in tandem. Um, so again, that makes sense to buy an, an, an ETF. 
That's not the same story that happens in countries like, uh, like uh, the, the Pacific Alliance, even in emerging markets. The correlations, as you can see, the correlations in emerging markets are, are lower than the correlations in developed markets. That suggests that it's, it makes sense to start thinking on the selective in emerging markets. In other words, if you, it, it's not very clear that if you want to be exposed to emerging markets, you just buy an ETF. It's much better to think, OK, okay I, want, I want exposure to emerging markets, but what kind of exposure? And depending on that, you can, you can uh, choose. You want exposure to commodities? OK, you can go to Latin America. You can uh, have exposure to financial to the financial system. You better go to China, for instance. So again, selectivity makes uh, makes makes a lot of sense in uh, in uh, in emerging markets. But even within emerging markets, it makes sense to be selective. The third the third table that you can you can see there shows how the correlation between the countries uh, in the Pacific Alliance region is even lower than the correlation of emerging markets. So again, even if you are convinced to invest in Pacific Alliance, it's better to be selective within the, the Pacific Alliance region. This, uh, this graph helps me to complement what I'm saying. Look, you, you, what you have here is like the, front, the, the efficient frontier of the equity markets around the world. So we have the Pacific Alliance here, we have the Pacific Alliance region, uh, and countries like Colombia, Peru, Mexico, this is the global emerging markets, uh, LATAM, so it's Pacific plus uh, Brazil. And as you can see, the Pacific Alliance stands on the efficient frontier, okay? So again, if you have if you want exposure to the Pacific Alliance, it makes sense to be selective. So what kind of exposure do I want? If you, if you want uh, banks, you can think on countries like Colombia and Peru. If you want uh, cement companies, you can think on countries like uh, uh, Mexico, for instance. If you want telecom, Mexico is, is a good choice. Um, Again, that's that's uh, you know that's the the point with uh, with the risk return profile of the uh, Pacific Alliance uh, region. Another exercise complementing this one is this. In this case, we plotted basically again it's a risk return profile, um, but in this case we are comparing the local pension funds against global multi-asset funds. Local currency. So you can see that the performance, the risk return performance of the uh, pension funds, the local pension funds, is quite good. Much better than the international multi asset funds. And thinking of that, uh, could be two reasons that can explain that. One is FX. Absolutely, and two could be they have a natural bias towards local assets. And again, that could explain in some in some uh, somehow could explain the much better uh, performance of the local pension funds in the Pacific Alliance region. The um, you know a question that always uh, pops up is okay. What's going to happen with the Latin America, and especially with the Pacific Islands region, with uh, Trump? And the answer is, uh, I mean, we are not concerned. We are not really concerned with 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 Trump. We, you know, we are taking care of what he says, but we are not really concerned. In this graph, you can see the uh, exports to the to the USA to the USA markets. It's, it's clear that Mexico represents the most of the region. 27% of GDP of Mexico, Mexican exports are to the US. However, for the entire region, less than 15% of GDP of the exports goes to the uh, United States. It's a low number. I mean, I, I'm pretty confident uh, that uh, 
you would expect a higher a higher figure for the uh, for the region that is I mean should be actively trading with the uh, U.S. So again, I mean it's, it's it's important, especially for Mexico, but I wouldn't say it's the end of the world for them. Uh, they have diversified a lot in uh, trading with with Asia and other and, and, and Europe, and that's why uh, again. You know, what happens to the U.S. is important to Mexico, but it's not the end of the world. And we, we could see that in the uh, exchange rate. In the, in the post-Trump uh, days, we saw a jump in exchange rate, a tremendous devaluation of the Mexican peso. But nowadays, it returned to pre-Trump uh, levels. So, I mean, it's, it's again, it's, you know, markets react, uh, sometimes react uh, dramatically. But now, now it's much more um, calm. OK. Um, these are some reasons of uh, why to invest in the Pacific Alliance region. And we have some comments here. One is a large consumer market. There is an emerging middle class that is willing to, con to consume a lot. The construction and infrastructure development, as I showed you before, is, is, uh, is humongous. Uh, a solid banking system, and you know, the MILA was created. The MILA is the integrated uh, financial system in the Pacific Alliance region. These countries, these four countries, Mexico, Colombia, Chile, and Peru, they created this, this uh, figure, the MILA, uh, and that way, the, 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 the stocks that are traded in an exchange are treated as local exchanges. So for instance, if you are in Peru and you want to buy a Colombian stock, that would be treated as a local transaction, right? So that's important, and, and we are expecting a huge impact in terms of the trading volume in the, in the, in the, in the exchanges in these four countries. The, 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 the country risk has also, has, has also uh, dropped since 2000 to 2000, 2004 until uh, 2017. In 2000, uh, the average credit, credit spread over the MB was uh, 340 basis points. Nowadays, it's, it's almost half of that. It's 180 basis points. And the outlook is mostly you know, stable for the countries except for Colombia. Uh, you can see here that for Chile, Mexico, and Peru, the outlook is stable. For Colombia, we have a negative uh, outlook. But again, what is relevant here, I think, is that this is this tremendous uh, reduction in credit spreads in the region since 2000 to 2017. We have political and regulatory stability. Uh, in this graph, I'm showing the, uh, low, the a lower country risk and also uh, the, favorable, the favorably ease of doing business. It's, it's remarkable how the region, you can see here, the region, the, the ease of doing business in the region is uh, is better than, for instance, the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, uh, and even much better than Brazil ease of doing business index. And last, but not least, the uh, ESG considerations are very critical and very important in the, in the region. And just to mention a case, for us in Sura, um, Sura, we are part of a holding company that is, uh, that is Sura Group, and Sura Group is part of the Dow Jones Sustainability Index. And in order to, you know, to keep that condition, we have to, we have to be very careful with, um, with the SG, ESG considerations. And with that, I would like to mention that we have to include, you know, in the, in the analysis, in the research we do to the companies, we are including ESG, ESG considerations. And also, we have uh, exclusions to invest in all these lists of uh, industries. Okay. 
And just to finish on time, uh, I'll leave you with this uh, beautiful picture of the angel of independence in the heart of Mexico City. Thank you very much. Uh, we might start with you, Jeff. There's a question about the geopolitical risks in Asia at the moment, particularly around North Korea, but I also guess around some of the instability around the South China Sea. Uh, do those um, play in your mind when you're thinking about the, the future over the next few years in investing in Asia? Yeah, sure. Uh, I thought that might come up. Um, that's when I wish this was vodka. Um, in terms of North Korea, look, I think the first point to make uh, on that issue is, to date, um, I think this is being viewed as a global issue rather than an Asian one, and th that's logical in, in many reasons. The, the obvious exception is if there were, God forbid, um, you know, uh, incursions or, or um, activities that would in involve the, the South or, or even Japan, and, and that would clearly change things then, but to date, if you look at the market patterns, frankly, markets have been pretty sober in their response to this issue. This issue. Uh, I guess we've seen it before, and until something happens, it's viewed as kind of a, a, another risk that we have to contend with. But we, we aren't positioning our portfolios explicitly around um, that type of event. The, the, the China issue is more nuanced and, and more interesting. Um, certainly, it d does have uh, wide-ranging permutations around the, the sort of the risk premium that you might require for an asset that could be exposed to uh, contested waters or, or, or growing tensions. But uh, again, we tend to view it in the, in the perspective of what's in the price and, uh, and what's reasonably likely to affect the, the earnings outlook for a particular company. Okay, and uh, Juan Carlos, uh, there's a question here about uh, what what does the correlation look like between uh, the Pacific Alliance and other DM and EM equities? And uh, does the correlation increase in periods of distress? Um, the, the, actually, the correlation in periods of, of uh, distress actually is lower within emerging markets. and. Um, but the, 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 the interesting point is that if you combine <coughs> uh, countries or, or regions like the Pacific Alliance and the, let's say, the Asia, emerging Asia, um, you know, you are creating a more efficient portfolio, right? So you are lowering your risk profile, whereas you can increase your expected, your expected return. So I would say, uh, I, I, the correlation is, is lower, but not, not only that, but also the combination of these of regions like the Pacific Alliance and the emerging Asia can, give, can, of, can offer you a better risk return profile. Okay, thank you. Now I'm going to try and squeeze two more questions in, in a minute, if we can. Uh, so first of all, uh, Jeff, to you. Uh, what's the level of regulation like in Asia? We're used to ASIC and APRA. Uh, what's going on in the countries that you're looking at over in Asia that sort of compare to ASIC and, and APRA type regulatory yeah. bodies? Uh, I'll assume you had a slightly cynical taint with that question. There's a great quote by Sahato once that said, what you call insider trading, we call family business. Um, <laughs> I, I think that is very much not the case across Asia as a whole. And, and typically, I think most of the markets we look at don't want for a lack of regulation. And in some markets, like Hong Kong, I think it would be superior to, to what we see here. Uh, and in others, it's, it, it's less advanced. But on the whole, uh, I think regula regulation, um, governance, and legal oversight is, is typically pretty good. Uh, obviously, there are exceptions to that. All right, good. And a final question for you, Juan Carlos. Uh, how can we be sure that the significant civil unrest that's happened in places like Venezuela uh, won't also happen and occur in places like Colombia and Peru? Wow. Tough question. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, Venezuela is a um, Venezuela is a. Uh, let me let me use the the right word for that. Uh, is, I would say it's a different story. Um, Colombia, countries like Colombia, Chile, Peru, they have very strong democracies, very strong democracies. To be honest, we are not exempt from, from, from that. Um, but uh, frankly speaking, it's, it's really, really hard. And the, you know, the probabilities uh, for, a, for, for something similar to what's going on in Venezuela are very, very low. You, I mean, you can see Colombia has a, you know, has a, has a history of a strong democracy over the last 50 years or so. Uh, Peru is about the same thing. Uh, Mexico, similar situation. And, and Chile, after the, the military government that they used to have, uh, they have a, a strong democracy. So again, I mean, Chile, uh, sorry, Venezuela, Ecuador is also, you know, a, a problem in, in the region, but uh, they are pretty much special cases, isolated cases. Okay, wonderful. Please thank our speakers.